Um, but so glad to be back with you today. We're getting ready for Easter. Uh, next Sunday, egg hunt, we'll have a balloon family photo booth set up as well. So come back next week. Today we got inflatables and food afterwards. So I'm just glad that you guys are here with us for church today. Uh, if you're new, I just want to welcome you. My name is Sean. I get to be the pastor here at Adobe. And we're just glad you chose to come hang out with us at church today. Uh, so welcome. So glad that you're here. We are in the back half of a series we are calling Family Matters. Uh, sometimes we do like deep dives into the Bible. Sometimes we do some practical stuff with scripture. And so this series, we're trying to give you a bunch of practical tools for how to do family. And so that's what this Family Matters series is about. Uh, we took the title from the show from the 90s. So we're trying to use some 90s uh, illustrations. These guys in the front are like, what's the 90s? Uh, <laughs> It really makes me feel old, but I'm so glad that you guys are sitting up front today. Love, love having the youth in church with us. So we're going to jump right in. This is part four. Uh, we're talking about titles in family that we hold, the titles that you have, family titles. And so some titles are given to you, some are chosen. Either way, every title that you carry carries with it its own set of privileges and responsibilities. Uh, our role in the family is important because it's interconnected to other people and the titles that they hold. And, and so the Bible gives really clear and accessible guidelines for us as to how we're to function in our roles and titles. And so, uh, so what do I mean by titles, right? You're like, well, what's my family title? Some titles that I hold uh, in my family would be son, right? The first title I ever held when I was born into this world. I was a son. I'm a brother. This title was forced upon me against, <laughs> against my will. Uh, I wasn't a very good one growing up. Um, dad also forced upon... No, uh, just um, we, we had a waitress at the restaurant when we lived in Rio Vista who didn't bother to learn my name. She just called me father of five. Um, like it, bring my kids in and she just called me father of five. So that was a title, dual title, right? Maybe uncle, pastor is a title I hold. Husband, uh, this one was by choice, uh, a, a good choice. Um, just added it over there at the golf course uh, 20 years ago almost. And so uh, maybe friend is a title you hold, maybe cousin, but we all have many different titles. And some of these you're born with, some you choose, some are forced upon you. But as you grow older, your titles keep expanding and you add and decrease your titles as you live through life. Uh, one title, mother-in-law. Mother-in-laws get a bad rap publicly. Uh, there's probably jokes to be made. I'm not going to make any mother-in-law jokes. Mother-in-laws, I know you have taken a lot of heat. Uh, you're valued. Like, I just want to let you know, mother-in-laws, you're important. Unless you're a monster, then you need Jesus. Uh, no jokes, I said. The Bible has a lot to say about titles. Uh, you, if you do a word search just on titles and family titles, uh, here's in the Bible, son is in there 2,544 times, father over 1,000 times, daughter 462 times, wife 325 times. So the Bible uses these roles and, and these titles to, to show us how to live. And, and so we need to live up to the titles that God has given you. Every title you have is God ordained. And so when you're ready for a new title, God will give you more titles. And you need to live up to these titles we have, especially the ones you choose to have. Now, some are forced on you. You should live up to those. Those are from the Lord. But if you choose to, uh, to carry a title, uh, you need to live up to them. And so don't take titles you're not ready for or that you don't want. If you hate children, don't assume the title of parent, uh, right? If you've taken the title parent and you hate kids, it's time to start loving kids because uh, that's a title that you have. If you aren't married, don't just get married to get married so your title changes. If, if you're single, you get to be selfish and you get to devote everything to the Lord. Uh, some of you were laughing like I was, you could be selfish for you. No, you have free time to just devote everything to the Lord. Uh, Paul said it's better to be single for that purpose as you can be solely devoted on the Lord. Like I don't get to be solely devoted to the Lord. I have a wife and some children that take up some of my devotion time to the Lord. And, 
Don't get married until that title is ready to be changed. And, and then also, don't act married. Don't take the title of married by having sex with someone until your title changes and you're married to them, right? And, and so some titles, or lack thereof, bring us guilt, right? Sometimes we, we operate in titles we shouldn't have, or we take titles we're not ready for, but, but our titles often create inner voices to us that cause guilt, right? Maybe you've heard this one before, I'm a failure as a parent. As a son or, or a daughter, I never got what I needed from my parents growing up. Maybe it's, I don't see my grandchildren enough. Maybe it's, I wish I wasn't single, or I wish I was a parent, titles we want or, or, or titles that we don't want to have, right? And, and guilt comes with these things, and we often feel like we don't measure up with some of the titles that we carry. And I want to challenge you today to, to walk in the titles that God has given you, to, to live up to your title. And if you're following Jesus, he will help you. If he's giving you the title, he will help you become the best version of you in that title. He'll overcome your shortfalls. He'll make up for you whatever you lack. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, here's what it says. It says, that is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. Where you feel weak in your titles, when you feel like you're not living up to the things you should be, or maybe in your past you failed in a few different ways, that's okay because God says, in your weakness, I can be made strong. And studies show that wives and moms carry the greatest guilt. Amen for being a dad. Thank God I don't have to deal. I don't have to carry that weight. The weight, though, of that title of mother, of wife, the, the regrets that you feel for not being good enough, the feelings of failure, you can't live in those feelings. You can't live in that place feeling like you're not good enough. And even if it's true, even if you failed, even if you made mistakes, and it's probably not, by the way, but even if you have had some hard things go on in, as being a mom or a wife in the past, you're here today, you're at church, you're, you're doing your best, you're working with the Lord, you're praying, God, would you help me be a better mom? Would you help me be a better wife, right? You're working on getting better. That's not failure. Failure is not moving forward. Failure is continuing to just sit in that cycle of, well, I feel like a failure. I keep failing. I'm just going to keep doing this over and over. Failure is letting the consequences of past sin stop you from moving forward into God's best for your today and your tomorrow. Husbands, pray for your wives. Kids, pray for your moms. They carry a heavy burden, a heavy burden. And husbands, speak life to your wives. If you're married, if you're do, doing family together, if you're raising kids or grandkids or you're, you're married, husbands, you need to speak life to your wives. You need to lift them up. You need to encourage them. You need to build them up in the Lord. Kids, this is grown kids included, right? Call your mother if she's still around. She wants you to call her. She just wants to hear from you. Even a text is better than nothing, maybe, right? This I'm preaching to myself also uh, sometimes. And tell her you love her. Tell her you appreciate her. Buy her flowers just because. Not, I know Mother's Day is coming up, like in five weeks you'll buy her flowers once a year. Just buy her just because flowers. Your mom wants to know that you're thinking about her and that you love her. Uh, my mom came and, and helped us with the kids when Amanda was going through a health scare right after Caleb was born. So uh, about five years? Is he six? Uh, when you have five kids, they're all just kids. Um, about six years ago. So she was going through some health stuff, and my mom came, and she helped and, and stayed with the kids. And, and so I bought her flowers. Uh, I paid extra. I just did it online because I can't be bothered to, like, you know, call a flower shop or whatever. Um, and, and so I was 32 years old. This, this is the first time I ever had bought my mom flowers. And she wept when she got them. She called me. She said, they're beautiful. Here's the picture. I pulled it off my phone, and she texted it. She posted it on Facebook. Oh, my son is so amazing. He bought me flowers, and they were the wrong ones. 
I paid for giant, expensive flowers. I paid for more colors. And, and she got these. She wept. I looked at him and thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to call and complain. I can't believe <laughs> how terrible these are. It didn't matter what kind of flowers came, right? Showing her that I appreciated her is what mattered. And so show your loved ones that you appreciate them. Proverbs 31 is a, a pretty famous chapter in the Bible. We tend to call it the traits of a virtuous woman. And, and women will read this chapter of this superwoman and be like, oh, so this is what God says I'm supposed to be and immediately realize that you don't measure up. Uh, right? If, I'm not, not going to go through the chapter today. It's too much, and I don't want you to feel bad. But if you go back and you read it, it's all of these superwoman traits of this one person. And it says that she's worth more than rubies. She lacks nothing of value. She only brings good. She brings food. Who, come on, like, you can be worth uh, less than rubies, but if you bring food, I'll be happy. She gets up before the day. She cares for the family. She buys a vineyard and takes care of it. She works vigorously. She's strong. She makes money on the stock exchange. She can craft and she can sew and she can scrapbook. She helps the poor. Some of this is added. If you, if you go back and read the chapter, you're like, I missed the part where they said they were scrapbooking. They hand make sheets and clothing. That's right from the Bible. Uh, she, uh, she supports her house financially. She's dignified and she has a great sense of humor. Like this is just, I just paraphrased a few things. It continues. She speaks wisdom. She's a teacher, takes care of the house, is never idle. So if you sit down and you put your feet up and have a cup of coffee, this ideal woman is better than you, according <laughs> to the writer of this Bible chapter. I'm just, if you don't wake up feeling all these things, her kids wake up and sing her praises. <laughs> and so does her husband. I'll read you one verse, Proverbs 31, verse 29. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. This chapter is an incredible chapter uh, about some qualities. And, and I think in the church at times we read this and we say, this is the ideal. I'm a wife. I'm a, a mother. This is how I, I should be. And can I just tell you, women, I wouldn't use that chapter as a measuring stick to know if I was doing a good job. Oof. <laughs> Clearly in our house, we don't use that. <laughs> But we read this chapter and we use it as a checklist for the virtuous woman or as a job description for mother and wife, but that's not what this is. This is a husband writing a poem to praise the woman he loves. And do you know what men do? They exaggerate. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been on a fishing trip. Um, <laughs> If you catch a fish, there's certain ways to hold your fish up and with the camera that it makes it look twice as large as the fish you actually caught is. And that's just one example. Uh, this isn't a checklist for men, right? This is not like, hey, this is what you want to look for when you're finding a spouse. This is one man boasting about how amazing his lady is. And he is a liar. There's no way every morning this lady's kids wake up and sing her praises. I'm just, I'm just saying. Uh, in the chapter, he also calls her a merchant ship. Uh, so husbands, just take note. Uh, Valentine's Day, we missed it this year, but maybe on her birthday, just say, hey, hey, baby, those hips remind me of a large ship carrying a bunch of cargo. That's a biblical way to tell someone you love them. And it's poetry, which is the worst kind of writing that exists. It's the cat of the writing world. That's a joke just for me, for some of you who don't like cats. 
There's really good principles to pull out of these verses, but that's all they are. They're great principles. They're not requirements. They're not, this is how you must be. Husbands, your takeaway should not be that you need to measure your wife against this chapter, but instead it should be as honoring as the guy who wrote this to your own spouse, right? You should go above him. You should speak so highly of your wife to others. And, and so the titles that we carry, they're not just job descriptions. They're titles to be lived up to, and these are great things to aspire to, but it doesn't mean if we miss the mark, we feel guilt and like we're failing. My, my first title was son, and Ephesians chapter 6 verse 2 says, honor your father and mother. Now, I'm so glad I wasn't a Christian as a kid, so I didn't have to do what the Bible said, uh, <laughs> because I did not honor my parents growing up. I wasn't the best of kids. And if you're a child today, the role of child is the first title that any of us ever have, then maybe grandchild at the same time. And when we live up to our God-given titles the way God intends, it brings honor to other people. If your kids honor you, it's going to bring you joy. Kids of all ages, right? You can be a bringer of joy simply by being honoring. Right, No matter how old your parents are, if they're still living, by, by honoring them, by, by telling them you love them, by serving them, like you're showing them honor just by doing that. And that's a God-given responsibility that we all have. Parents, you can bring honor by disciplining your kids, uh, right? It, it, when, you, when you discipline them, you're putting them on a straight path that God has ordained for them. And, and so thank God for a timely no from a parent. Now, most children want more freedom than they're ready for, right? They, they want to, to have no boundaries. And my kids are always asking me, can I do this? Can I watch that? They want more than they can handle. When you were a kid, you wanted more than you can handle. Parents are there to help them handle the things they can handle and to protect them from everything else. And so our titles work in tandem to help each other, to love, to grow, and to protect our families, honor and respect your parents to fulfill the title of son or daughter. Care for your parents when they age, when they're widowed. It's an honor to care for elderly parents when they can no longer care for themselves. It's a challenge. It's not going to feel rewarding, but, but it's the responsibility that God has given to us to care for elderly parents when they can't care for themselves. And, and so you live in that role because you're the only one who can honor them the way God has ordained it. And, and so you give honor as they're on their way to their eternal reward. And, and that's a challenge and a burden, but also an honor and responsibility. And in my family growing up, I always told uh, my parents, hey, I don't want to inherit any of your wealth. Use all your money to put yourself into a really great home so that I don't have to take care of you. My sister uh, was a CNA, and so we kind of offloaded, like, yeah, well, you can take care of them. You do that for a living. And I'll just tell you, that's the wrong attitude to have. I don't carry that anymore too much. And, and, and that's, but that's not the right thing. Just, well, I'll just shoulder, I'll pawn them off onto to someone else, right? Or uh, we, we sort of hoped that we'd have a rich sibling growing up who could just kind of pay for everything if our parents needed care. And, and on that note, don't foster sibling rivalries. If you're raising kids, don't pit your kids against each other. Uh, I think I should have been an only child uh, <laughs> because why would they need another one when you get the best one uh, at the first? And so... All the oldest siblings get that one. If middle children, you're like, that's rude. <laughs> and youngest children disagree. They think they're the favorites. And so don't play favorites with your children and don't play siblings against each other. Um, parents, do not have a favorite kid. The enemy attacks us in our families with jealousy to our siblings. In my family growing up uh, with siblings, we had a ranking system. Nobody ever ranked themselves the favorite, which is weird. Someone would have to be the favorite in, in our ranking, and, and nobody thought that they were the favorite. And most of the time, we'd all rank ourselves last. Oh, everyone is loved more than me. Now, I know that I'm the favorite. <laughs> uh, 
No, I'm, I'm definitely not the favorite. Um, but, but don't pit your kids against, well, mom will love you more than so-and-so because you do this. Or, well, we have more in common, so, so I love you more. No, like, it doesn't work that way. You might have more natural things in common with certain kids, but don't favoritize them because of it. A Huffington Post article said four out of five people have siblings. So most people have siblings, and si- siblings have a bigger connection than just simple biology, right? They're growing up together. They do life together in a really close way, and they will be the closest person that they have if family is done the right way. So don't have favorites. Don't encourage rivalries. It's divisive for your family. In the first week of this series, we talked about Cain killing his brother Abel. It started in the very first family at the beginning of people, like brothers were pit against each other. And As you go through the book of Genesis, Families are divided because of sibling rivalries. In Genesis 25, Jacob and Esau, their brothers, with parents who played favorites, literally each parent had a favorite kid and like publicized it. At least if you have favorites, pretend that you love them all. Uh, that's, that's what we did my family growing up. Like we just, well, my mom would say she loves us all the same, but let's still rank ourselves. The reality of it is like, don't do that. This is what this family in Genesis did. Well, I have this favorite and I have this favorite. And they pitted their family against one another and they built divisiveness into the family, which led to deceptions and lies and trickery and hurt. And it ripped this family apart. If you've done this in the past, it's easy to go forward. Stop doing it. It's just that simple. Don't do it anymore. Change. We said in the first week, right? You can change your family right now. Make changes. If you have a kid that likes things uh, that you think are dumb, do those dumb things with that kid. It's not about you. And can I tell you everything they do is dumb? Uh, Right? It's different from what you did, and all the things they like make no sense, and that's okay, right? I don't love watching Bluey, but we watch Bluey together. And, and I don't love playing Barbie, um, but we play Barbies together because I got a kid that does it. Do I love hearing about Animal Crossing? No, not especially. But like, I'll listen to these things because I love my kids. And so I want to hear what they have to say. And don't say, well, this kid likes what I like, so I'll spend more time with them. That inadvertently pits them against each other. It inadvertently makes them feel like there's favorites, and you're harming your family when you do that. If you think I like tea parties and dancing and princesses or movies about dolls or YouTube videos where people are watching other people do things, I don't get it at all. But I do like those things because I like being with my kids, and so I'm fine doing things that aren't important to me for them. I like them because my kids like them. And and so, right, I went and watched them for cheerleading. Cheerleading is what I do in my living room when I'm watching sports on TV for teams that I like, right? And, And so instead, I paid money every week to watch my kids cheer for other people's kids playing football. That's... That's, I, if you're a cheer parent, like, that's a lot of love. You're watching people watch people. And I, I paid to watch people watch people. If your parents played favorites growing up, learn from their mistakes. Don't do the things that they did wrong that you say like, oh, I'm so bummed out that this happened in my family growing up. And then you're doing the same things, like be the one who makes the change. Jacob, he learns no lesson, right? His parents have two favorites. His mom is, uh, he's his mom's favorites. The dad likes Esau. So Jacob grows up, gets married. He has 12 sons, uh, several wives, and different message for a different series. He has a favorite of his 12 sons. He tells everyone about it, and the brothers hate the favorite, and it continues the family drama. He didn't learn anything from it. And if there's something in your family lineage that you don't like, change it today. Pray today before we end this service. Say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke this curse that I feel like I've been living under and and just end it and say, not in my house and not any longer and not in my family. We're not gonna live this way. Today, you can start a new legacy with Jesus and you can end family history issues right now. 
Jacob's sons hate seeing the favorite son, so they throw him into a dry well to die. Uh, hopefully you haven't done this in any of your sibling rivalries. There'll be time for repentance at the end of the service. In Genesis chapter 37, they decide to kill him. Then Reuben, uh, one brother, like gets a little conscience, and he convinces him, well, let's just throw him in the well. And Judah, the nice brother, says, let's not kill him. Let's sell him into slavery instead. That way he's still alive. And so this is a, a little bit of a problem with these siblings. And they mess up, and instead of confessing, now they have to live a lie. They bring back a bloody coat. So now they've staged a death. They fabricate a story to their dad. Any uh, sound familiar to your childhoods? Like we fabricated a lot of stories to our dad. Now everything they do is living to keep this lie going, sin upon sin. And this happens in our families. And the titles you hold that come with responsibility, if you lie or you do something and, and you try to cover it, now you've, you've created a new responsibility and a new story that you have to live out. And, and you continue to sin. And, and so they get married. The wife hears about the lost brother. And, oh, they say, oh, it's, it's so sad. And Right now they're deceiving their their marriage because oh well yeah I had this brother he died in a horrific animal accident but we have a piece of his coat to remember him by and you're you're like continuing this web of lies now in other areas of family and your sins compound when you blow it and when you blow it with one title it affects all the titles that you carry and so when you blow it ask for forgiveness or it's going to ruin all the titles and. Rebecca, if you want to come up, don't let one mistake derail your titles. Live up to the title brother or sister if you're of those 80% not only children. Can I tell you, if you're an only child, you don't have brothers or sisters? Being part of God's family, you have brothers and sisters. This isn't just biological family. This is just how we do life with people. And I've had to work at this brother and sister title as an adult because I was not a nice sibling growing up. And so I've had to, to mend these relationships. Romans chapter 12, verse 10 says, love one another with brotherly affection. It's assumed that there's a deep love that comes with brother. Outdo one another in showing honor. We're supposed to love our family, and that standard then helps us love others. If there isn't love in the family, choose to love people today love each other like family does. And, and then it says to love your church family like family. What would it look like if you loved people in this church the way you love your family? Would it be ugly? Like is family a little messy and if you started treating people like that, I'd have to ask you to leave? What if you loved your family the same way you love your church family? Would it be better? We're all on the same team. We are not rivals. Your siblings aren't your rivals. We're teammates. Your siblings are your teammates. And sometimes you have bad teammates. Sometimes you're a bad teammate. You don't have to continue being that way. It doesn't have to stay broken. Every title that you step into requires you to kill more selfishness. We've talked about this every single week in this series. Selfishness ruins families. When you get married, you die to self. When you have kids, you can't have anything that's just your own ever again. <laughs> this side got it. The only title that getting selfishness out of doesn't apply to is grandparent. Grandparent, you get to be selfish. You get to just come in, you just get to love, you just get to, to do what you want to do to love grandparents and your kids will be like, they're, they're gone in a few hours, just let them do it. Can I tell you this? If you don't grow in to your title, you might lose it. Moms and dads, you're called to serve and train and build the spiritual and the vocational in your kids. I have... You might be wondering all service long, why is there a glass full of googly eyes on, on the stage? Uh, there are 936 googly eyes in this glass. We told you, I think in the first week, we had the jar uh, with 150 <clears throat> some odd items, and that's the number of hours that you get in the week. 
this is number of weeks you get with your children. 936 weeks from birth to age 18. And I want you to think it seems like a lot, but you, you dump some out. That's a year of your kid's life right there. And you only have so much time to shape them. And I wanna challenge you in this. I, I'm learning this now, because it seems like for 16 years that we've had kids, we've always had babies. And it's the first season where we don't have babies in the house. It's the first time I've ever missed a stage of life. And I remember being burned out and being tired. And I remember telling people, they, oh, you're gonna miss this stage. And I couldn't wait to get out of that stage. I just wanted to sleep through the night for one time. And I'll tell you this, and you, you understand if you've been in this stage, I would trade a night of sleep for those baby stages all over again. 936 weeks goes by really fast. I have a kid who turns 18 in two years. I have about 105 weeks left before she's an adult. Let that title of parent shape the stage that you're in today. Don't feel like if you don't have the title that you want of husband or, or wife, that, that you're not valued. The Bible says it's better, right? You have this time and, and the titles will come when they're supposed to come. If you're here and you're single, you are valued, you are honored, you are respected. It's a great stage of life. That title single isn't uh, to be changed one day. It's not waiting to be married. And so walk in that title, that season that you're in. And, and so if you're single, we honor you today. Sometimes you lose a title through loss. The church stands with you. When somebody loses a title or, or loses a title holder, right? We, we lose loved ones who held something for us. The church needs to be there. It's a place of comfort and hope and healing and restoration. The Bible says to be a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. We prayed for our missionary, Jeff Duvall. I, I have an opportunity. I'm going to go with him in May to Zambia to, to do some orphanage stuff and, and bring back an opportunity for us as a church to partner with orphans. And it's a way that we can help provide parents and spiritual care for those who don't have it. Psalm 68, 6 says, he sets the lonely in families. The church family should be for those who, who have loss in their biological ones. We help those who've lost loved ones. You're here in this church for a reason. Maybe it's because of inflatables and food today, and that's awesome. We're, we're happy if you're here for that. Maybe you've been here for decades. God has put you here for a purpose. He's given you the family that you have to be with you. Matthew 12, 50 says, whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. When we do the will of God, we are the family of God. So I wanna end with this challenge for you today. Would you stand? <clears throat> Worship team, you can come up. Here's a challenge for you this week. I want you to go and to honor people in your life. People who have titles with you, people who you have titles for or with. But I want you to find someone that you're connected to via a title and honor them today. Honor your parents if they're still with you. If you have the ability, can I just encourage you this week, pick up the phone, send them a text. You don't even have to talk to them. I'm giving you, if you're like, I'm on the fence about this one, just text them. Then they'll call. <laughs> and then you'll be like, uh, can I send it to voicemail? I just texted them. That's a really good example of what not to do this week. If they call, pick up the phone. Call your kids if you have them. If you have adult kids, maybe you haven't seen them or heard from them, and then listen, if they send you straight to voicemail, just pray for them. Just let them know, hey, I was just calling to let you know I love you. I miss you. They might not respond 
every time, but, but they still want to hear that as well. Call up a niece or a nephew that you have a relationship with. Talk to a sibling. I'd encourage you in this. This is kind of the, if you can do this, reach out to someone in your family that you've had a broken relationship with. In healthy ways, we don't want, want you to do things that are going to create too much strife, but, but prayerfully consider, is there some way to start creating a bridge to heal family relationships? Call them, tell them you love them, give them specifics. Tell people why you love them. You know how we praise the Lord? We, we tell God good things about who he is to us and, and why we love him and how thankful we are. Do that with your loved ones. That's how you show someone you appreciate them. Tell them they're as great as the guy from Proverbs 31 feels about his wife. There's all kinds of great lines. Tell your spouse something incredible. If you need some, some good language, in Song of Solomon, he gives all kinds of wonderful language to his wife. Like your hair is like a flock of goats flowing down Mount Gilead. I've memorized certain Bible verses that benefit me. <laughs> Tell your loved ones why you love them. Do it this week. You never know when you don't have time to tell them anymore. Use the titles you have today to lift up others in their titles. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you love us. And God, the very first title that any of us ever held was son or daughter to our Father in heaven. And God, you love us like a parent, unconditionally. When we fail, when we mess up, when we make mistakes, God, you're right there to pick us up. You never stop loving us. God, you don't compare us to anyone else. And so, Lord, I pray first above all things that right now in these moments we would feel your love, the love of our Heavenly Father. Maybe you're here today and say, I don't know Jesus. I've never felt that love. My family was broken growing up, or I had a great family, but I don't know the love of God. And you're here today and you'd say, I want to join the family of God. I'd like a new title, and that's to be a son or daughter of the king, of, of the creator of the universe. If that's you and you're here today, I just want to give you an opportunity to respond. I want to pray for you. We're not going to make a big spectacle, but if you're here and you'd say, I, I just want to know more about God. I want to know about this Jesus, God's son who became flesh, who lived on this world, who sacrificed his life so that anything we ever did wrong could be forgiven. If you're here and you want to make that decision today, you just say, I want God as my heavenly father. Would you just raise your hand so I could pray for you if that's you and you've never done that before? Secondly, you're here and you would just say this, I have some relationships in my family. I have some titles that haven't been lived up to or that I haven't lived up to. And you would just be willing to say to God today, Lord, would you help me? Would you help me to do better? Would you help to restore this person? But God, would you, would you work in our family to build up our titles? And you feel like you would just say, God, would you help me with that? Would you raise your hand so I could pray for you today? Thank you. Hands, can you just keep them up. Lord, I pray for the hands but I pray to God for those in our family who are represented by the raised hands. Lord, we pray for deep reconciliation to take place where there has been brokenness. God, we pray for your healing where there has been loss, for your healing, God, where there has been hurt and pain. Some of the hardest things we've ever endured have come from broken family relationships. And God, I pray that right now you would just supernaturally restore our hearts, that you would bring us back together where it can be done. But God, most important that you would just be 
what we feel like we lost out on, that you would replace those things from the past that we missed. God, that moving forward, we wouldn't repeat mistakes from the past. And God, that when it comes to titles, you would help us to walk in the ones that you have given us, that you would prepare us for future ones. God, that you would comfort us for ones that have been lost. Lord, we trust you. We need you. God, as we take a few minutes to sing this final song, Lord, we commit our households, our families, our marriages, our kids, our parents, our grandparents, our grandkids, our great greats, Lord, we commit it all to you and ask that you would help us to change by the power of your spirit our families today. In Jesus' name we pray.